to today's meeting of the Planning Applications Subcommittee. Uh, my name is uh, Joseph Anstey and I will be clerking uh, this morning's meeting. As you're aware, uh, the public element of today's meeting is being live streamed and those participating in the meeting have given consent uh, to their inclusion. The recording will be available on the City Corporation's YouTube channel following the meeting and it shall be retained for up to one civic year. Uh, now, now, whilst we endeavour to live stream all our public meetings, technical difficulties may sometimes prevent live broadcast. In these instances, we aim to upload a recording after the end of the meeting. All personal data will be processed in accordance with the Data Protection Act 2018. And for any further information on that, please do feel free to contact us. Uh, and uh, a reminder in terms of audio quality uh, for all, please, to speak into your microphones uh, when you are addressing uh, the meeting. Uh, without further ado, then, I will hand us over to uh, the chair for today's meeting, which is uh, Mr. Graham Packham. Good morning, Chair. Uh, thank you, Town Clerk. Good morning, everybody, uh, both in the room and uh, members of the public and those watching on the live stream. Um, I'd like to start off by welcoming uh, Natasha Lodone back to the committee. <laughs> Congratulate you on your success successful project. <laughs> and uh, I'd just like to mention that uh, about 12 noon, we will have a short comfort break. Um, so I think Natasha will uh, be here. do some maternal uh, activities then. Uh, right, uh, 10 o'clock, uh, apologies. Uh, thank you, uh, Chairman. Uh, I've received apologies for absence from uh, Deputy Shravan Joshi, the Chairman, uh, Deputy Michael Cassidy, Jasper Hodgson, Alderman Simon Pryke, uh, and Ian Seaton, uh, with a couple of members who have uh, given notice that they uh, will need to observe today's meeting online, of course being a local authority, meaning uh, that they uh, will be unable to actively participate, uh, of which they are both aware. Uh, are there any further apologies that members are aware of? Seeing none, uh, declarations? Any declarations of interest from members under the Code of Conduct, please? Uh, seeing none, let's move on. Uh, item number three, then, uh, is the public minutes of the last meeting of the subcommittee that was held on the 13th of February, uh, there for decision at page five. Any uh, comments on accuracy? Uh, matters arising? So those who are to agree? Thank you. Excellent, thank you. Uh, with uh, those being agreed, we move on then to agenda item four. This is the application uh, for Hill House 1 Little New Street, London EC4A3JR. Uh, in addition to the agenda pack, members will have received uh, an officer presentation, a uh, slide pack, and uh, two addenda, one circulated on Friday the 5th of April and one on Monday the 8th uh, of April. Uh, this is a report of uh, the Planning and Development Director and is for decision. I will hand over now then to uh, Pani colleagues to present the application. Thank you. Morning, Paul. Uh, morning, Chair. Morning. Okay, this is an application for the redevelopment of Hill House on Little New Street. It's in Castle Baynard Ward. The existing building is comprised of predominantly office in addition to library use, bar and gym use. The existing building is seven storeys with two basement levels. The application here today is for the redevelopment of the site to provide a tall building of ground plus 18 storeys. The existing basement slab at basement level two is proposed to be retained alongside perimeter walls and the remaining structure would be demolished. This is the existing and proposed site plan uh, showing the surrounding context with Little New Street to the north, Wine Office Court to the south um, and Fleet Street is located further to the south. south. Um, there is residential nearby, including at Pemberton House um, and at Wine Office Court. It's important to note there is a significant level change across the site from east to west. Just for a bit of heritage context, the site is not within a conservation area and is not listed. The Fleet Street Conservation Area is located nearby to the south, um, and there are a number of listed buildings nearby as well. There are also conservation areas nearby in Westminster. I'll now run through photos um, for the existing site. This is a view from Stonecutter Court, looking southwest. Here you can see, um, around the centre of the photo, the existing entrance to the Shoe Lane Library at the site, which has limited active frontage at present um, and appears somewhat underwhelming at present. Uh, to the left of the screen is a photo from Wine Office Court, looking north. To the right is a photo from Gunpowder Square, looking northeast. 
Uh, this is a view from Printer Street looking south, um, another photo that demonstrates the lack of active frontage of the existing site. Uh, this um, is our photos of the existing city walkway. So this run through the centre of the site, running from north to south. Um, it's currently underused and an unattractive route. Uh, as part of the application, uh, the applicant proposes the loss of city walkway. Um, and in this case, it's considered acceptable due to the fact it's an unattractive route at present um, and underused. Um, and there would be the inclusion of new public realm across the site. Overall, that would be an increase of 52 square metres. Um, so there's no overall loss in publicly accessible space. Um, this is a proposed ground floor plan. Um, so this shows to the north uh, the office entrance there in orange. Um, to the east is the restaurant um, which is located at level uh, 17 of the building. Um, and then below that in blue is the loading bay. The loading bay is in the same location as existing. Uh, then to the south, shown in green, is the cycle store entrance. Uh, the applicant is proposing London plan compliance short and long stay cycle parking. Um, there's also short stay parking uh, provided externally at Wine Office Court and at Gunpowder Square. Uh, to the southwest in pink, you can see the entrance to the new library. Uh, this is moved from the northeast corner. Um, and now has an entrance at grade. So in the existing condition, there is, the library is entered from the northeast corner. However, you have to go down two levels, um, and it's located at basement level two. Um, just above the library in the proposed plan is the entrance to the gym auditorium use, and that's located at basement level as well. Um, and then to the uh, northwest of the plan, shown in purple, is a flexible cafe retail use, which should be connected to both the office lobby and also to the library. Uh, I think this plan demonstrates that there is significantly enhanced active frontage across the site and a mix of uses compared to the existing site. Um, so I'll take you through some plans now. Um, this is the existing and proposed basement two level plans. As I mentioned, the existing library is at basement level two uh, on the left of the screen. Um, and on the right of the screen is the proposed uh, plan, which is comprised of plant. Um, it's important to note at this level, 90% of the existing substructure is retained as part of the development. Um, this is the existing proposed basement level one plans. Uh, on the right of the screen is the proposed plan. Um, there would be 863 cycle parking spaces provided across the site um, with the majority of these at basement level. There's also a flexible gym auditorium use at this level as well, proposed. This is the proposed low ground floor showing the loading bay. Um, and it's important to note that there would be a consolidation of deliveries, um, which would avoid peak hours, um, and also that the loading bay is located uh, to the opposite site of the residence. This is the proposed upper ground floor um, and shows the library uh, at ground floor in pink. Um, the library also is at mezzanine level above this um, and shows the retail use. Too. This is the proposed upper ground mezzanine, showing the library. Um, it's important to note there are two platform lifts from ground floor to uh, mezzanine level, um, and the cost of maintenance of these will be covered by the developer and secured in the section 106. This level also shows to the right of the screen in lighter pink, uh, the flexible, affordable workspace library use proposed by the developer, uh, which the library's team would have the opportunity to operate and secure sustainable income from. Um, just going back one level, actually, uh, just back to upper ground floor, uh, this also includes the provision of a changing places toilet, which is a larger accessible toilet with additional equipment. Um, there's understood to only be one of these in a venue in the city at present. Uh, so now I'll go through some typical proposed office floor plans um, from level one. Um, through to level 16. So at level one, this is where the terraces start. Um, you'll see that as the building steps back, um, the terraces uh, go upwards towards the northeast. This is level two, level three, four,
So when you get to proposed level 17, this is the proposed rooftop restaurant, um, which is accessed from Shoe Lane. Uh, this is proposed level 18. So this uh, in blue shows the office immunity space surrounded by a larger terrace. Uh, as part of the application, regular access for the library and for community uses has been agreed with the applicant um, to the floor space and also to the terrace. This includes weekly access for the library on Friday mornings, fortnightly access for the library for the Dragon Cafe, uh, a, a mental health uh, programme that the library offer at the moment, um, and other similar health and wellbeing uses, um, and also exclusive access for the library for four weekends a year for events. In addition to that, there'll be 22 weekends of the year for the library or other communi community related activities as well. And this would be secured through the section 106. This is the proposed level 18 uh, mezzanine level, which is showing uh, plant and green roof. And this is the roof level, which shows uh, PV panels um, and green roof. Uh, these are now, I'm gonna go through the existing and proposed elevations for the proposal. Um, so these are the existing and proposed west elevations, the proposal to the right. Um, in this proposed elevation, we can see the well-defined base of the building and how the terraces recede and cascade and the rooftop pavilion uh, which crowns its top. This is the existing and proposed south elevation. This is the existing proposed east elevation and the existing proposed north elevation. Uh, these elevations helpfully uh, show the significant level change across the site. And this is the proposed southwest elevation. Here you can also see the well-defined base and how the terraces sweep up to the top of the building to sculpt it and create a dynamic architectural form. Just touching on sustainability, the applicant is aiming for a high quality sustainability uh, sorry, is aiming for high quality sustainability credentials, um, including an all electric system with air source heat pumps. The developer is also aiming for BRIAM outstanding and well gold standard. As I previously mentioned, the proposal would retain 90% of the existing substructure and would also include measures for biodiversity, urban greening, and solar panels. Uh, there would also be approximately 28 trees proposed across ground at the site. Um, in addition to the significant greening on the terraces, which you can see here in the photo, in the visual, sorry. So just moving on to heritage impacts. This is a proposed view of St. Paul's Cathedral from Cannon Street. Uh, this demonstrates, it's quite far in the distance, but this demonstrates that Hill House would be almost entirely screened by the implemented scheme at 120 Fleet Street. Um, and Hill House would not be visible to the naked eye behind 120 Fleet Street. This is an exist, existing river prospect view. Um, it's an LVMF protected view. And this is the proposal. I'll just flick through again, back and forth. This is the existing. This is the proposed. In this view, we can see the development in the middle background um, in the existing tall buildings at New Street Square. The attractive sweeping form um, and well articulated elevations would offer a new high quality piece of architecture with a skyline presence that would complement the varied layering of the townscape in this view. This is an existing view from the Strand um, and this demonstrates the impact to St Mary Le Strand, a grade one listed church in Westminster. This is an identified view in Westminster's uh, views SPD. So this is the existing image. This is the proposed. I'll just flip through again. Existing. Proposed. Um, its former massing is not considered to challenge or undermine the principal architectural features of the church, namely its ornate tower and steeple. And uh, we, uh, offices considered uh, would still be read clearly in both long and short views. Uh, just touching on daylight sunlight, so a full assessment was undertaken for impact to nearby residential properties. Um, this is a photo of Pemberton House. This is the property uh, which is closest to the proposed development. Um, so for Pemberton House, um, which is the image here, um, also Wine Office Court um, and 1 to 23 Bolt Court, these experience a range of minor to major adverse impacts in daylight sunlight terms. Um, the applicant also submitted some radiance modelling uh, for Pemberton House. 
uh, which is closest to the site. And here's an example from the first floor level, showing existing to the left of the screen and proposed on the right. Uh, the results demonstrate the extent of change um, and that levels in the existing condition are quite low, with minor changes in the proposed. Um, and it is considered this unlikely to alter the use of the rooms. Despite some non-compliance against BRE guidelines as a result of the proposal, it's not considered that it would result in unacceptable impact to the existing use of the properties in the context of the location of the site in a dense urban area. In addition, officers uh, uh, requested an independent review was undertaken, um, and that concluded that results are not considered unacceptable in the urban context. Therefore, uh, they're not considered to uh, conflict with local plan policy in this regard. So I'll just go through some visuals of the, screen, of the proposal. This is a visual looking northeast. Another visual showing the terraces. This is a visualization of uh, the library entrance at the Gunpowder Square. Again, this is a Gunpowder Square looking at the library entrance. So, to summarize, the benefits of the proposal are that it would deliver 57,000 square meters of much needed, best in class, grade A office space, accommodating some 3,000 employees. It would contribute to the continued resurgence of the Fleet Street area, very much a focus of new quality, new quality office floor space. Over 860 long and short stay cycle parking and consolidated delivery strategy with off-peak servicing. It would provide a unique architectural response with cascading stepped green landscape terraces. It would re-provide the Shoe Lane Library with enhanced facilities, flexible, affordable workspace, public toilet facilities, including a changing places toilet and a more prominent entrance, um, and also includes exclusive managed use of the level 18 amenity space for the library and community events, offering outstanding views of the city would have exceptional sustainability credentials with 90% retention of substructure and targeting Briam outstanding, would result in 52 square metres increase in public realm um, and improved landscaping across Gunpowder Square, which is subject to a Section 278 agreement, with new street trees um, and over 500% increase in biodiversity net gain. There would also be a flexible gym auditorium use with an offer for discounted use for qualifying users and groups to be agreed in section 106 um, and finally the provision of public art. For the library there will be a significantly enhanced library offer with the potential to generate income from meeting rooms um, and from affordable workspace. The section 106 agreement will secure the reprovision of the library at Hill House and the temporary relocation during construction to one new change subject to the grant of planning permission. Financial security in the form of a payment or guarantee will be given by the applicant to ensure the corporation can deliver the library in the event the applicant fails to deliver in accordance with the agreed timetable. The applicant would meet the costs and carry out works for the fit out and furnish of both the temporary and the permanent library. New lease terms would include a peppercorn rent throughout the 65 year term with a reasonable cap on service charge to be agreed with better commercial terms than the existing lease or to be negotiated in the section 106. Therefore, to conclude, it's the view of officers that the proposal complies with the development plan when considered as a whole, and that material planning, condition, uh, sorry, that material planning considerations weigh in favour of the scheme. Therefore, it's recommended that the planning permission is granted subject to all relevant conditions being applied, and section 106 obligations being entered into, and a section 278 agreement, in order to secure the benefits and minimise the impacts of the proposal. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Sam Clark, can you just explain the next part of the process? Uh, yes, thank you, Chairman. So, uh, so we will now uh, move on to speakers, uh, and then uh, subsequent to that, there will be questions of speakers, uh, then questions of officers. Uh, before then, we move on to the debate. Uh, the debate. Uh, there are no uh, objections registered uh, to speak against the proposals uh, this morning, Chairman. So, I'll move us uh, straight to uh, speakers in support of the proposals. And today, we have uh, Oliver Hunt and Ross Pyrie speaking. In support, are they are you both here? You can come one at a time or one after the other, but um, as you'll have seen from the uh, registration, you have uh, up to five minutes each and uh, no more than 10 minutes in total. Uh, so uh, I don't know if you're sort of who's, who's going first, please. I will. 
Okay. So uh, when I will, when you start speaking, I will turn the lights on. Uh, the green uh, means go. I'll put both uh, lights on together when you have 30 seconds left. And when just the red light is left on, that's uh, your time up. Okay, so thank you. Thank you. Good morning, Chair and Members. My name is Oliver Hunt, Development Director at Landsec, and joining me today to talk more about the design for our proposals is Ross Perry, Lead Architect at APT. Before we take you through our plans, I'd like to talk briefly about Landsec, our development ethos and the work we're already doing in the city. We have a growing portfolio of properties and development projects in the square mile, including one new change and 55 Old Broad Street, where we're combining flexible office space with new leisure, culture and amenity concepts, supporting your destination city ambition. We've recently invested in full refurbishments of both Dashwood House near Liverpool Street and 3 New Street Square, expanding the footprint of our flexible office business, Mayo. Dashwood House is also one of the first buildings being delivered through our Net Zero Fund, replacing gas-fired boilers with, an all -electric air source heat, with all electric air source heat pumps. But with all of our developments, our purpose is to realize a place's potential. With the increase in hybrid working, we understand the challenge of driving people into the city seven days a week. Our offices nowadays have to be more than just a place to work. They need to draw people in and earn the commute. The City Plan, <coughs> excuse me, the city plan 2040 also identifies a need to future-proof the city's office stock, ensuring that our workspaces are flexible and can adapt to the needs of different occupiers. This has guided our thinking with Hill House and our proposals will meet the demand for flexible and amenity-rich office space. We've engaged extensively with planning, design, and sustainability officers since October 2022. And during this time, we've consulted widely to ensure that a range of feedback is considered in the plans. This includes working with Shoe Lane Library team and a number of important stakeholders, including the Surveyor of the Fabric of St. Paul's, Historic England, and City of London Access Group, as well as other statutory consultees, such as the Fleet Street Quarter Bid, who have shown support for our plans. We've also held a number of events and creative workshops for people living and working in the city to share their hopes for the scheme. Our objective for Hill House has been to create a sustainable and healthy workplace, transforming the building, building into a multi-use destination. We will create state-of-the-art new office space, all with access to outdoor terraces, a newly landscaped gunpowder square, a modernised and improved shoe lane library, and a new rooftop bar and restaurant that provides stunning panoramic views of the capital and will be a vital addition to the area's social appeal. Sustainability, wellness and biodiversity will be at the very core of the development, with each floor having access to outdoor terrace space, with an urban forest cascading down from the top of the building. We will also revitalise the areas around the building with green spaces for the public to enjoy and improvements to pedestrian access around the site. All of this will sit at the heart of the Fleet Street Quarter, which is also undergoing a once-in-a-generation period of change, with, five billion pound, with a £5 billion pipeline of 34 new and refurbished office retail and leisure schemes. One element of the proposals that we are most excited about is the reimagining of Shoe Lane Library. Libraries play a fundamental role in most communities. In a recent independent review, Baroness Sanderson of Welton referred to libraries as a third space, somewhere that is not work and not home, but where people can enjoy a feeling of being together. However, we've seen the closure of almost 800 libraries across the UK since 2010. In order to safeguard their survival, it's crucial they remain relevant and capable of meeting the future needs of the communities they provide for. Shoe Lane Library is a hidden gem in London Square Mile, an important local resource located in the lower basement level of Hill House. It's home for more than 40 years now. It offers an extensive range of services and is a key local centre for learning and collaboration. However, it lacks the prominence it deserves. Our plans will be transformational, placing the library at the heart of the building in a purpose-built home on the ground floor, providing like-for-like -like usable area. The library will be secured for the long term in a location with better accessibility, significantly more presence, and direct access to outside space. During development, the library will be temporarily relocated to one new change next to St Paul's Cathedral, and we've prepared a plan for this in advance so that the library services are uninterrupted. The future of the library will be safeguarded with a new 65-year lease at a peppercorn rent. It can also benefit from the income generated from the additional flexible workspace adjacent to the new library and will have access to the roof for events and activities. I'll now hand over to Ross to discuss the building's design and landscaping proposals in a bit more detail. Thank you. My name is Ross Perry and I'm the lead architect for Hill House. 
At APT, we are an award-winning studio with recent successes in the City of London, with our Urban S City project winning City Building of the Year, as well as being shortlisted for an RIBA award. Our commercial office scheme in Westminster, the Earnshaw, has also recently been shortlisted for the upcoming BCO awards. We know that an important part of designing any building is ensuring it fits naturally within its environment, and this is something we've carefully considered for Hill House. The shape and form of the building has been sculpted to enhance views from the South Bank, the River and the Strand. The building directly responds to its immediate environment by minimising its impact on neighbouring residential and office buildings with its terraced form. From shape, height and scale to colour and texture, every element of the building is being curated with the intention of complementing the wider area. We have taken inspiration from the buildings within the Fleet Street Conservation Area to ensure our proposals respond to the character of the surroundings and feel connected to its heritage by using materials of similar textures and tones. We see a significant opportunity with Hill House to create a new destination in the most sustainable way possible. We will be retaining nearly 60 per cent of the existing structure, meaning no new foundations and reusing existing building materials wherever possible resulting in a significant embodied carbon saving while also minimising disruption to our neighbours. We are aiming for Hill House to be best in class in terms of environmental and sustainability targets and we have devised a specific sustainability strategy for the scheme. This includes an innovative facade system that is efficient, lightweight and reduces energy use and this includes openable vents for natural ventilation. We are also exploring cutting-edge material opportunities such as repurposed steel columns that have been salvaged from North Sea oil rigs, as well as sustainable cement replacements that will significantly reduce the concrete frames and body carbon. We are looking towards ambitious biodiversity and urban greening targets. All occupants will have access to green terrace space at every level to promote health and well-being. And significant planting will create a vertical forest that cascades down the building, hosting wildlife and improving biodiversity, in particular at Gunpowder Square, where a number of new trees, planting and benches will create a high quality area of public realm for all to use. Library users have also been at the front of mind during the design process, with many of them inputting into our vision for the new library space. We have also worked closely with a fantastic team at Shoe Lane Library, who we would like to extend our thanks to, to ensure plans capture their expertise and passion for libraries. We have held design workshops and site visits to other libraries for inspiration, and this will be a continual process to evolve and refine the library's plans. We are also delighted that Baroness Sanderson will be joining us for a one-night book club on the future of libraries next month, alongside a range of expert contributors. If I could just finish by thanking the Chair and fellow committee members for your time today um, and officers for their dedication and challenge during the design process. Landsec, as an organisation that is heavily invested in the long-term sustainability of the city, understands that for it to thrive, it needs to respond to the needs of those that work and visit here with the needs of those that call the city their home. We believe the scheme before you today successfully responds to those needs. Your offices have concluded that our proposals would optimise the site, delivering a transformative new mixed-use destination for the area. We hope that you agree and can support this application, and we'd be happy to take any questions that you may have. Thank you. Thank you. So, uh, question from members. So, to start with John. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Yeah, well, first, I'd just like to make a comment I heard about the um, reuse of uh, pieces of oil rig, so um, I think that's an excellent idea, and there'll be lots more of that metal coming off oil rigs, I'm, I'm sure. So I've got two questions, both relating to the library. Um, um, the first one, I think it's pretty obvious, but you mentioned there's lifts um, joining the three levels of the library. It, it just wasn't quite clear from what we read that, that they were lifts for the public, so for you know, wheelchair, or for, for example, they're not just lifts for the librarians to move books. So that's one question. And, and the second one is, um, in our notes um, on page 110, it, 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 it mentions um, incidental play features will be part of the public realm design, which, which is an excellent thing. I like that very much. I wasn't sure where that was going to go. So what I'd like to know is, uh, have, have you considered um, sort of combining that with the, the glass front of a library? So, so in other words, if, if, if a family came um, with, with a range of ch children, um, that some are interested in inside the library and some are interested in playing, then, then you could have 
a situation where, where, where the responsible adult or person was, was, could be inside, but with children reading and also observing what's going on with the kids playing outside, because you can combine the whole thing because of the way you've designed the library with a glass frontage to um, gunpowder square. So that, that's all those elements are here, but they haven't been tied together. So I'd just like you to consider that, assuming that this application is approved. Thank you, Chairman. If I could just respond to the, the, the second question. Um, we intend to bring forward a, a public art strategy, which we um, will work with local communities and the city um, to formulate. Um, in terms of incidental play features, we absolutely see those forming a part of Gunpowder Square externally so that they can interact with the library space. Um, you're right, the, 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 the library garden space immediately outside um, it, it is, is, uh, has natural surveillance from the internal space of the library. And there would certainly be an opportunity, I think, to link the two um, with the public art strategy as well. In terms of library lifts, there are two um, lifts within the library space that are uh, entirely for public use. There's a separate goods lift um, for transporting the library's uh, books and other equipment um, separate to those two. There's also a further uh, backup lift in the cafe space which is linked to the library at ground floor level and mezzanine level. Uh, thank you, Chairman, um, and thank you uh, to the Landsex team and the architect for uh, their presentation, which is very helpful. Uh, I must say, I think the uh, proposals are very uh, attractive and, and a substantial improvement on um, <coughs> what's there on so many levels, uh, the aesthetics, the ESG factors, uh, the quality office space and the library, all of which get big ticks in my box. I do note that the, the mass of the building is, is substantially greater than that that is there uh, at the moment. Uh, and really, just for the, for, to the architect, um, wh why did you sort of land on that size, particularly that height? Why not go two floors higher uh, or two floors lower? Um, thank you. Cool. Yeah, an excellent question. Um, so the, the height, scale, shape and form of the buildings all been designed, uh, taking into consideration views from Cannon Street, the South Bank, as well as um, you know, views from Westminster. Um, so working with our townscapes consultant and the wider design team, um, that's the most appropriate scale for the building. It means that we're technically invisible from Cannon Street, which was effectively the limiter of height um, for the, the building. And then the rest of the scheme has been sculpted to create a dynamic and articulate form from the South Bank as well as Strand. Thank you. Brendan. Thank you, Chair. I would like to ask a uh, question about cycle parking. Uh, so we're expecting 3,000 employees to uh, be using um, the building. Uh, a significant proportion of those people may arrive uh, on a bicycle. Now, I've noticed in other major developments, we have lots of uh, internal bike parking. And it doesn't actually get used as much as the external bike parking in terms of the e-bikes that people rent. And uh, on a recent visit to the site, I, I noticed that Wine Office Court was just completely congested uh, with uh, rental bicycles. Could you bring some clarity uh, on how we're going to uh, deal with that? Perhaps uh, some of the internal storage could be accessible to people leaving their e-bikes and then picking them up again. Is there, is there any plan around that? I'm very concerned about some of the beautiful public realm you're talking about just being completely littered. Uh, with e-bikes. Uh, if I can first say, we, we haven't specifically considered internal storage for e-bikes, but we have allowed for uh, an area of internal storage for visitor cycling to complement the external cycling. So that is certainly something we can look, look to accommodate. Um, but I agree with you, they are becoming a bit of an issue around the site. Um, we manage all of our buildings um, and have 24-hour security presence, which I hope will, will alleviate that, um, albeit um, if we can accommodate them internally, that is something we'll look to provide. Uh, Mary. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Um, 
Yes, as a member for Castle Baynard and also chair of Port Health and Environmental Services, I'm absolutely delighted to see this proposal. I think it's excellent, um, and I'm not surprised there are no objections. Um, on page 38 at the bottom, it talks about the changing places toilet, which I think is um, an excellent idea and, and very welcome. Um, certainly on Port Health, we spend a considerable amount of time talking about the provision or lack of provision of public toilets in the city. And, and this is good that new developments enclose these, this idea. Um, can you uh, explain who is going to be responsible for the maintenance and, uh, uh, of the toilets and um, where, exactly where they are, particularly in, com um, in com contact to the library, um, which should obviously be one of the main users of those, those facilities? Thank you very much. Thank you. The Change in Places toilet will be located on the ground floor of the library, so that in, in, in one of its most accessible locations. In terms of the ongoing um, maintenance of the Change in Places facility, that will be the responsibility of Landsec. Um, the, the Change in Places toilets can typically be booked, um, or uh, somebody may have a particular key that can access that space. So during library hours, that should be entirely accessible to those that need to use it. Thank you. Deborah. Uh, Natasha? I just had a question about um, the B2 plus option that was, we're told, considered. Um, that option I, we see on page 92 um, is described as something which would have caused problems with regards to achieving the improvements, improvements to the ground floor um, it says B1 and B2 plus. I just wanted to understand what, when you did the designing of those options, which contained a lot greater refurbishment and obviously had a, a, a much reduced whole life carbon impact, um, what was it that was able to be at the ground floor? Could you just help us with what the design was for the ground floor in relation to that, so that we understand what it was that was not possible to do at the ground floor in relation to B2 plus? Um, that would be very helpful. And just, and just I, I note that one of the members had mentioned there being no objections. There are, of course, um, objections, um, I think, believe six objections to the um, plan. So I just wanted to make that clear for members of the public. Thank you. Um, so in relation to B2+, plus, um, the ground floor would still be able to contain the uses that we had proposed within the proposed scheme. They just be of lesser quality and that was down to the retention of the level one floor slab that as you can see on if uh, from the existing images that level one floor slab actually doesn't have as great a floor to ceiling um, in the surrounding context so it would mean that the library space internally would be compromised from a reduced floor to ceiling and wouldn't have the qualitative benefits that we're able to um, um, propose in the proposed scheme without then removing further of that level one floor slab in order to compare it on a like-for-like -like basis. We're also restricted with the existing structure um, in terms of the floor slab, with its upstands and downstands, particularly at the perimeter, which would then make um, um, poor thermally performing facades at those levels that are retained, um, as well as limiting daylight into the office floor plates, as well as the ground floor uses. Just to clarify, in relation to the library space, the, the space itself, in terms of square footage, square metres, that would still be available. You're just talking about the height of the space, is that right? Correct, yeah, the floor to ceiling would be compromised. Thank you. Any more questions? Um, Marianne. Thank you, Chairman. I just wonder if you can talk us through um, your wind analysis. Um, we're seeing more and more tall buildings in the city and the cumulative impact of, of winds. And um, I'm always a bit suspicious about, you know, sitting wind, walking wind, comfortable, frequent. It doesn't actually um, give us any uh, tangible understanding of how windy it can be. Uh, and also the noise that's generated. If you walk along Fenchurch Street, you can hear the wind howling frequently. So, um, you know, you're putting up a, an incredibly tall building 
um, it will be the tallest in that area and therefore you've already identified there will be wind effects on the terraces. So can you just talk us through that please? Thank you. Go. Thank you. Um, yes, yeah, so we've had both CFD and wind uh, tunnel testing uh, for the scheme. Um, and those results have actually proven that in some instances in the ground floor, we're actually having a positive impact, so an improvement upon the base scheme. Um, all spaces um, within the surrounding public realm, as well as the terraces, have been identified for their proposed uses, whether that be for occasional sitting or walking, um, and as well as um, assessing the impact on the surrounding um, terrace as well for the, the, the neighbouring properties. Any other questions? Um, I, I have one. Um, the, the bleacher, the bleachers in the library um, are taking up a lot of space. Is that, are they just purely for p watching performances or, and if not, uh, how's, how's that going to work? And what about accessible access to those? Thank you, Graeme. The, the bleacher seats are um, multifunctional. They provide uh, a, seat, a seated and working area, um, particularly with the provision of power sockets and the like. Um, on library visits, we've, we've um, not on site visits, we've been to other libraries. These are very well used spaces, and, they, and of course, they have the added benefit of becoming a, a performance or event space um, when needed. In terms of accessible um, use of those bleacher seats, there will be specific provision for accessible use at, at the bottom and top steps of the bleacher seats. Any other questions before we move on to questions to the officers? Thank you. Uh, questions for the officers. Deborah. Yes. Thank you. It's. Um I note that there are public benefits in the application, library, cycle area, retail spaces, and the landscape terraces. Uh, following the committee's recent experience of public benefits being removed, for example, from the Newgate Street development where public access to a roof terrace has been uh, removed without the case returning to the planning committee, how can we be confident that public benefits outlined in this development and in others won't be removed through officers using de delegated authority. Thank you. Who's going to answer that one? Peter? Yeah. Thank you, Chair. The, um, the proposed benefits that are referenced, uh, to clarify, the scheme has not identified any heritage harm and such. Uh, the balancing exercise for acquiring public benefits has been triggered. So the proposed uh, benefits that have been uh, uh, referred to uh, comprise policy requirements in terms of the reprovision of the library, the cycle parking, the public realm and so on, uh, and the roof access is considered to be uh, commensurate with the reprovision of the library itself. So I can give committee the assurance that should there be any future uh, alteration, proposal or amendment to uh, come to officers, we would bring this back before committee. Um, could, could I just add that, um, I'm, I mean, these things like the library provision and the facilities are red lines. Um, so uh, uh, there won't be any rowing back on this. That, that would be unacceptable. Um, I'd, I'd also like to um, uh, just talk about the nearby residences. So overlooking on the terraces and so on, and uh, conditions on the terraces to um, mitigate noise. Again, they're red lines. So um, uh, you know, any, any relaxation of those wouldn't be acceptable. So we'd expect officers to come back to the committee if uh, uh, not, you know, not to agree this under delegation. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Noted. <clears throat> Thank you, Chairman. I'm sorry I've got rather a lot um, of questions. Um, firstly, uh, perhaps I can just go to, um, to the, the conditions which we've, we've got um, on this building. Um, and I note that there are 85, and I'm saying 85, although there are 84 in the conditions because there are two number three conditions. Um, and I just wonder 
why on earth we're conditioning a building with so many conditions. And then there are conditions that I find aren't there. Um, for instance, um, hostile vehicle uh, uh, mitigation. We're talking about the fact, I, I, I was understanding that the policy is actually that vehicle mitigation um, is, is done within the, fr within the form of the building, not more bollards in the street. And I, there's nothing in the conditions that will, will allow, um, that, that will stop us having more bollards in the street. Um, I think uh, I wanted to check what happens um, when a building doesn't meet the targets. Um, we, we have lots of targets which say we're targeting outstanding, we're possibly getting excellent, um, and yet it's all conditioned right at the end. So I'm, I, I would like to know what happens when we don't meet those targets. Um, another question, and which is probably the, the I think it's for our chief planning officer. Um, we have spent an awful lot of time working on a new local plan. That new local plan puts the maximum height of buildings in that area as 90 metres over the ordinance datum. We are, we are being asked, before that, that is even on, this, on, our, on our radar, to go 4.8, i.e. nearly 5 metres taller. If it was five centimetres, it might be quite acceptable. But why on earth are we allowing... What is the point of us having a local plan with policies if we're just not going to even, even listen to them? Um, sorry, that's, that's just... Uh, yes, yeah, sorry, just, just one more point on the conditions. And this is really because of... Um, what has been happening quite a lot recently about buildings being demolished and then being left because of, um, of, of issues of funding or changes of mind. Um, and I, there are a number of conditions in the conditions which actually allow demolition before these conditions are um, carried out. And I'm wondering why and whether it would be politic now to change and make sure that most conditions are actually met before the, uh, the building is demolished. Thank you. Thank you. Officers. I'm just going to answer the question about HVM first. Um, so there is a condition within uh, the report and the papers, um, condition 28. Can you Could you just enter the microphone? Oh, sorry, sorry. Yeah. Uh, condition 28, as referenced in the report, uh, requires the development to incorporate such measures that are necessary within the site to resist structural damage arising from an attack uh, with a road vehicle or road vehicle borne explosive device um, and those details must be submitted to uh, planning and approved. Um, in addition, within the uh, section, sorry, the heads of terms section of the report, um, it outlines the various works that will be agreed as part of a Section 278 agreement, which includes the removal of redundant bollards, which is to be agreed later through that agreement. So I think the ne your next question was about the targets not being reached, um, the conditions. Do I have to switch anything? Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes, yep. Yeah. Um, the uh, questions about the targets um, that are conditioned. Um, the, the point is that many of the targets can only be confirmed to be reached once the development has been uh, through the detailed design phase, knowing of all the materials, knowing all the details of the development that, that have been achieved. So, which is the reason why we're asking for the final confirmation of those targets by condition. And in the case where they can't be reached, we would require the applicants to provide a detailed justification as to why the targets cannot be reached. But that happens very rarely in reality. Thank you. On the, <coughs> on the height of the building and in relation to the emerging um, local plan, we understand the point. The, lo the emerging local plan can't be given 
much weight at the moment, very limited weight, as it's now subject to public consultation. There is a breach of the threshold height that is um, advocated in the plan, but that has been um, subject to a very thorough qualitative and views assessment and is considered to be acceptable. It's within the kind of margin of error, a few metres above that um, height, that uh, we think that is supported in this instance. If I can just take the question in terms of the appropriate triggers and being pre-demolition, we do have um, a requirement through national guidance to apply appropriate triggers uh, throughout the uh, development pipeline that is being proposed. And so there, that explains why there is a range of pre-commencement, pre-demolition and various phases thereafter. We consider that the triggers that have been applied are appropriate for the details that are uh, being required within that particular condition. I mean, you do understand there's a real sensitivity on this topic at the moment. Um, you know, we've seen what's happened recently on Fleet Street, which is... Which is this area. Yeah. Any other questions? Natasha. Uh, just to come back on the point around the emerging local plan, I just want to be clear because we're being told in one breath to treat it with some, um, only consider it in a minor way because the, it's an emerging plan. But then I, I look at page 35 and we're being pointed to the fact the Eastern Cluster and City Cluster policy is in our current local plan and the emerging city plan um, of course proposes the Hol Holborn and, and Fleet Street Valley cluster so it feels a little bit like we're being told that we should see the local plan which doesn't specifically give a height restriction for the context of the height being okay but then we're being told the Fleet Street cluster is being developed so that should be relied upon to some part to ensure that um, that, that kind of height is acceptable. Um, I certainly would appreciate some clarity on um, a number of matters. So I just want to ask about the increase in deliveries, um, which is referred to on page 33. Um, it, it's an increase from what there was before. I assume that's because of the, the huge increase in the number of um, office workers. Um, just want to check that that's the, the absolute minimum that could be achieved. Um, I also wanted clarity in relation to some of the figures. Hopefully, this, um, paper copies do sometimes help. Um, the figures for whole life carbon, this is on page 48, um, with the helpful table. I can't marry these up, and it may just be me. Um, but if you look at um, the total carbon emissions for option four, so option C, which is the proposed, um, it says 85,320, which is clearly hugely greater than option B2, for example, which is 66,000. So uh, it's certainly a quarter greater than that, nearly a third. Um, but when I look at the top of that box 15, it says total whole life carbon emissions, 92,019 tonnes. So I wanted to understand the discrepancy there, and it may just be me missing something that I'm supposed to have added in. Um, secondly, the figures for total whole life carbon for option C, which is proposed in terms of operational, 1,678 in the table, and then above 1,612 tonnes per square metre. So, again, not, not clear on the discrepancy there. It may be me missing something. Uh, and we're being told the policy target is outstanding, and that was certainly referred to in the officer's presentation. But when one looks at the target bream rating at box 17, it says policy target excellent or outstanding, and although outstanding is circled brightly in pretty green, excellent, sounds like it's also the policy targets. I wanted clarity on the policy target absolutely being outstanding, and that just being an error to include excellent there, and also the discrepancies in the figures um, there. Um, and then I, there may be some questions to follow on from that, but that would be very helpful. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I think you're referring to the uh, options table with the figures of 85,320 and uh, 1,678 for operational. And then you're preparing it to the whole life cycle carbon assessment of the application scheme. These figures will be different naturally because the application scheme has been calculated with uh, much more detail. So the figures will never match. Uh, do I get that right that you compare those figures? 
Sorry, it's, pro it's probably me being um, unclear. Um, it's box 15, page 30, 48, box 15, or where it says 15, whole life carbon, whole life cycle carbon emissions, and then the whole life carbon cycle carbon options. So I'd understood that option four of those four was the one that was effectively being gone for, and therefore I didn't understand why the box above said 92,000. But it's the reality, actually, that, that those were the options assessed to a relatively low level of certainty, and that since then the figure is revised, given the greater clarity having decided upon effectively option C. That's correct, yes. And therefore considerably higher by some 7,000 Yes. Tons. Right. Yeah. Uh, and so, okay. And then clarity on the target BREAM rating? Yeah. So, so the policy target is excellent or above. So we probably should have said excellent and above in the fact sheet and not excellent and outstanding. But the uh, policy target is excellent and uh, the applicants targeting outstanding. Okay. okay. So what you mean is that our policy targets excellent, but that they are targeting outstanding. Yes. Okay. Our yeah, policy that's, target that's is not a minimum. Yeah, sorry, it's a minimum of excellent. Okay. I, I just had one further question in relation to operational carbon. And um, we're, we're told that 35% operational carbon emission savings is the, um, the GLA um, figure that's sought, and that that is. Um, understood to be something which is, which is not necessarily straightforward to be achieved by commercial buildings. Um, yeah. Can I understand how much lower this falls? Because 35%, if it was 34%, 33%, one might understand. But can I understand how much lower the operational carbon emission savings of this development will be as against that 35% figure that's supposed to be sought to be reached? Yeah, at the moment it stands at 13%, which is uh, pretty... Sorry, was it 30 or 13? 13, 1, 3 okay. percent, that which is uh, from the recent uh, cases uh, that have been approved in the last year, say, it's about average 13 percent, and that, that is because of the more stringent Part L 2021 uh, regulations that have um, reduced the ability of commercial developments to perform to their targets, but the GLA uh, is expecting that to improve very soon, so during the, the, the next few years. Sorry, just that's the average of what we as a council yes. have approved. Yes, when, when you look at the, say, all the uh, major applications we have approved in the last year, say, since the uh, adoption of the Part L 2021, um, most schemes achieve a, a figure around 10%, some below, some slightly above, depending on the mix of users. Um, so 13% in this case is, is pretty average at the moment for commercial schemes. Average for what we as a council yes. are approving for commercial yes. schemes. Do we know whether it's average in terms of other equivalent? Because we're being told that 35% is really difficult. Yes. So I want to understand whether 25% might also be really difficult or that's something that's achievable. So do we know, for example, as against another local authority or as against another city, whether they're achieving those figures? No, we don't know that. But we know that 25% would be difficult and only if it's a, a designed to be extreme, extremely energy efficient. So if they were specifically focusing on energy efficiency as a goal? Yeah, and also depending on the mix of users, where, where you have a hotel or residential use, for example, they are classed as residential, so for them it's much easier to achieve the 35 or even exceed the 35 target. Thank you. Okay. More questions? Deborah. Uh, it's possibly already in the paper somewhere, but on page 104, when we're talking about um, including in section 106 what the public access hours <coughs> are, could somebody please just, just confirm with me what the uh, public access hours are likely to be? Thank you. Uh, thank you. Is that in regards to the library or the rooftop or both? It says um, library, community use 
and educational. Um, so, as part of the 106 package, um, the library would have access to uh, the rooftop amenity on level 18, um, and that includes a terrace and um, internal amenity space. Um, they would have access on Friday mornings. Um, they would also have access fortnightly uh, for the Dragon Cafe provision that currently operates there. Um, in addition, four times a year, um, the library would have exclusive use from Fridays to Sundays as well. Um, in addition to that, 22 weekends a year would be available for uh, community groups um, and library access as well. Um, sorry. Uh, Brendan first, then you, Natasha. Sorry. Um, thank you, Chair. Um, officers, can we go back to the picture that showed uh, St Mary Le Strand? Um, I think it showed an existing, uh, and then propose. I mean, we just have a look at that. Um, that looks like a pretty significant um, change to me, and I can understand why Historic England and the City of Westminster Council um, said that that is causing harm uh, to the Grade One listed um, St Mary Le Strand. Can, can we know a bit more about the discussions? Uh, that went on with the applicant. Has that reduced to get to where we are in terms of the existing and proposed? Uh, can we know a little bit more about uh, the process that got us to this, to this point? Thank you. Uh, yes, the, the height of the proposal was revised over time to respond to views such as this and also the view from Cannon Street. Um, and this way, Officers have concluded, respectfully acknowledging HE and Westminster's comments, um, that actually the proposal would be a recessive fleeting background presence in these views. This is a kinetic experience, remember, that you have as you go along towards the churches. They would hold their own in the foreground at all times. Natasha. Um, actually, on the historic England point, um, it might just be me, but I was looking through the papers and I've, we've got all of the objections from individuals, but historic England, mm. although factored in to the response of city officers to what Historic England has said. And with a very short summary, I, and it may be that I'm just not looking properly, but I've had to go on to the full planning portal yes. to find Historic England, City of Westminster's objections. And I just want to understand if that's our usual approach, that we don't put those who are a really important uh, consultee <coughs> and who give substantive responses um, if we don't put that in the papers because it may be that all members have gone onto the planning portal and read very carefully and diligently every single consultee response in there but it, it, it's not the usual habit as i understand and normally people focus on what we're provided with for the committee meeting so have i missed it and it's in there in which case apologies for any kind of criticism and um, if not is that our usual policy uh, and why on earth would we not include Historic England, City of Westminster, within the paper pack, that means all the members are informed. I'm conscious that at least one member thought there were no objections. So it's very helpful to clarify what, what happened there. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, yes, thank you. Uh, the standard practice is to append uh, resident representations and not those of statutory or other bodies. Uh, we can take that as a note, uh, move him forward uh, and append them in future. Uh, they are fully summarised, as you note, know, within the report uh, and responded to within the body text. But we can take that away for a future reference. Thank you. There's, there's a lot Ian. Thank you, Jim. Could I uh, just ask officers, uh, what sort of scrutiny is, is carried out on the uh, um, letters of support? Because it's clear to me that those 40 letters have, uh, have been produced by the same person, a mail merged and sent mm. across within a very short time period. And surely we should be doing some sort of verification on those sort of letters or emails in this case. Yes, thank you. Uh, we are aware of this uh, as an emerging uh, issue in inverted commas. Um, we have received, uh, as set out in the report, a number of effectively duplicate letters of support uh, from different individuals. We've treated them as we would through our statement of community involvement uh, as any other representation uh, and have acknowledged them and have notified them of committee. But moving forward, we are in discussions with developers and their representatives uh, as to whether this is an appropriate way of garnering support for a planning proposal. 
but they are summarised and given the relative amounts of weight within the report. Thank you. Marianne. Thank you, Chairman. It's probably addressed to you as much as the officers. It's just going back on Natasha's points. Um, when I read the, uh, the documents the other day, I couldn't find a lot of the comments and representations that were received. Westminster Council, um, the surveyor to the fabric of St Paul's, um, historic England. And we, we've marked them down as external consultation, but they are representation. And we used to ensure that everything was put into our pack so that we could read it. You have a summary, but sometimes things can take, be taken out of context. Um, you know, we, we've been told that Historic England um, haven't objected. They haven't objected to a development on the site, but they have put in a very strong objection to the impact on the, on the um, heritage in the area. And I think it would be beneficial for members to actually see these objections firsthand rather than just rely on summaries. I think it's, it's our job. The websites, the planning website, isn't it always easy? There's 100, 103 documents on there, I think. Um, and every time you click off it for more than five minutes, you've got to go into the whole process. So it'd be much easier if officers could please do that. And I don't know when we change that policy, uh, to be quite frank. But I think it's important to note that Westminster's comments and Historic England's both identify the impact on the heritage, which could have been resolved, and they actually asked in their letter for officers to, to try and mitigate that and resolve that. And that could have been done by just pulling the heights and the bulk and slimming it down. Um, and I will further comments from, from Sue about our policies um, and the, the impacts that we have on our heritage sites we seem to sort of brush over all of the negative impacts these developments have by simply saying, well, you're never going to get any building that accords 100% with our policy. Well, of course, we're not going to, but that doesn't mean that we shouldn't be striving to ensure that we're not having a detrimental impact on our heritage or our views, because that's what makes the City of London different. Um, and... and if we're going to just keep saying this and throwing the baby out with the bathwater, we might as well stop wasting our time with the local plan, save officers time and money, and just allow developers to do exactly what they like. Because officers could have reeled that back in to make it completely acceptable and, and mitigate those impacts on heritage. And I can't see in there any correspondence apart from the applicant who responded to Historic England and St Paul's uh, with their views of the comments. But I can't see our officers actually trying to say to developer, pull it back and not have that impact. I can't see that in the, in the documentation on the website. So the question is, uh, the question is, I think you want the, con the statutory consultees there in future papers, their uh, uh, comments included rather than members having to sort that. And I think that's a reasonable request, yeah. So I think we can just take that, that forward. Any other questions for officers? Uh, Sue. Yes. Sorry, I just missed one on the daylight and the effect on, um, on the, the residences. And I noticed uh, in, um, it's actually on page 176, paragraph 604, um, it's just, this is uh, on Pemberton House, so just one of the properties affected, uh, 19 windows, nine serve living spaces. And then we have this extraordinary comment that although the 19 living spaces are not BRE compliant, this already is the case and the existing condition. This is the problem that we, when you live in the city, you already live with below required lighting levels. And yet we're merrily saying it's quite acceptable to have to reduce it even further. I think we should be very careful about how we word these kind of things, because this just apply, it seems to me that it's just saying, well, we'll go every time, we'll take another little bit of light, we'll take another little bit of light, and in the end you'll have nothing, but hey, it was an existing condition. This is not acceptable. Um, Thank you. Could we just talk about right to light and what role it plays in, in, the, in the planning decision. I so. And I understand there's a, a process that can happen outside 
of the yeah, plan? Yeah, so just to differentiate uh, daylight sunlight impacts, which are considered through the planning process, and then right to light, which is not a material planning consideration, is dealt with outside the planning process. But in terms of uh, the reference to the impacts to Pemberton House, uh, this was in relation to the fact that the major and moderate impacts are um, often seen because of the relative change. So there might be low existing levels serving uh, room um, and a, a small absolute reduction uh, would result in a percentage loss that would be considered minor, uh, sorry, moderate to major. So that's what that uh, uh, sentence was referring to. Um, we agree that it's really important to protect the existing at daylight for properties. Um, that's why officers um, instructed a third party review on the daylight sunlight just to ensure um, that it was robustly uh, assessed um, and that third party review found um, that the light levels were not considered unacceptable. In addition, um, we uh, had a radiance assessment for that property specifically to really interrogate the impacts further in terms of the daylight that would be experienced in the room as I summarized in the presentation. Uh, Marianne. Thank you. Thank you. It's on terms of the servicing. Um, the, the increase in the deliveries and the assumed 98 trips, assumed if 50% is consolidated and 5% of all trips are undertaken by cargo bikes. We have a number of large developments around there already which have a lot of servicing. Um, I'm not sure that we've actually... Um, I have asked for a report on consolidation, how many of the applications that we've granted that had a condition about consolidation are actually consolidating. Um, because we know one of the, the, the biggest problems with our city is uh, the roads congestion. And we're now suggesting that um, uh, the delivery is outside, outside peak times, but there are residents there as well. So you're also hitting the problem about deliveries after 11 o'clock at night because the impact on residents. So I'm a bit concerned about how they are actually going to deliver all of these deliveries in a very short window of time, regardless of the fact they've got two loading bays. But more importantly, what happens if they don't? What's the mitigation matter? What happens in terms of the winds and the effect on winds, as we saw with the walkie-talkie, and we find out afterwards there is a problem? How are we going to resolve all this? I can't see the conditions in there. And as Sue says, a lot of this is all condition, condition, because this is a very outlined scheme. A lot of the detail has to be worked up. And we've said before about schemes coming before us without all this detail worked up. So we're really sort of granting something which can really change quite dramatically if we find out things can't, don't work or can't be invented, Chairman. Sorry, uh, Pearl is just looking through the relevant conditions. Just to take the, the last point, um, the service and management strategy will be refined through the further design considerations you'd expect a developer and their architects to go through as their occupiers come online and their requirements. The details will be submitted through condition and they will have to be approved by officers to be acceptable within regards to the particular location and the impacts uh, onto nearby residents and other uh, stakeholders and, re and receptors, for instance. The loading bay here is located to the southeast of the site, well away from Pemberton House and other residents. Uh, the, the numbers that have been outlined in the report are the current predictions uh, that will be firmed up with greater detail through the submission of condition through the uh, service and management strategy, which is secured through the 106 in the heads of terms. Um, additionally, uh, taken to the point of if this isn't accorded with, or well, that would be a breach of the obligation in this case, would be prosecutable. Um, before you sit down, um, Landsec own a, a number of buildings very close by. So could you uh, explore with them whether they could consider a consolidation uh, for the whole, not just this building, but <coughs> they've got some very large buildings nearby that they own. So uh, it seems to me there's, a, uh, there's an opportunity to optimise the whole square. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. That level of consolidation would be explored when we're talking about uh, developers who either have other developments and land interests, and we've done that elsewhere as well, so we will oh, be pursuing with the, that. With the same owner. So, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Norm. 
Thank you. Um, just looking at the photo on the screen in front of us, while I understand the reasons for improving the public realm, there's no getting away from on the right hand of the photo that's been, that is the actual residential block. How do you plan to mitigate the noise by sticking seating in front of the residential block? And as we know, voices do not travel and there's nowhere for them to escape to. Yeah, thank you for that question, an important consideration. Um, the public realm as shown in the visuals is illustrative um, and will be worked through as secured through condition um, and also section 106 obligations, including a section 278. Um, the landscaping has uh, deliberately provided a buffer from uh, the residential windows um, uh, in order to mitigate against disturbance and noise, but it's something will be considered further through detailed design. Any other questions? Natasha. It's just for the, um, the from the legal perspective, um, I just want to be clear as to we as, whether we as members given the consultee's comments on the website and not part of the papers, are, for us to determine this application, are we required to have read those consultee's um, contributions? I'm conscious, for example, that in the summary of Historic England, Historic England said um, that it was challenging the view. I just searched challenging in the papers pack. That's not in there. So people haven't read the full picture. So I just want to understand from the law officer's perspective, whether or not we as members need to have read the consultee's comments or whether simply reading what's here is sufficient for us to determine the application. Chair, I believe that the members can make this decision um, because it has been contained in the background papers and it's been covered adequately in the report. Any other questions? Okay, can we go move to the debate now? Who would like to start? Are we going straight to a vote then? Don't have the microphone. Someone should kick it off. Um, so, I think it's a real shame that what we've got is so close to being something that I think could have been a really excellent proposal. Um, I'm actually, although it may not seem um, obvious, I'm actually quite keen to be able to approve something like this because, you know, the, the fact of the retention of the library is obviously really valuable. Um, I see B2 plus in the columns for the options, and it seems to me that if we'd landed on B2 plus, there would be no need for a debate at all. You have a hugely reduced carbon footprint from that. 66,000 as against now 92,000. Um, I know that figure can change slightly, but it looks like it's in within a small margin. Um, you would still get the same space for the library, albeit the reduced height, although the height seems to be used simply for these bleachers and, and I, and I think the chair might have hinted he also queried whether or not those bleachers might be the best use of library space. Um, the height of the building would have been 15 storeys, 15 storeys falling well below the 90 metres, which is the maximum. Our careful emerging plan after what has been four years or five years of debate around it, much longer than it should have been taking. And of course, that emerging plan is late because it should have been in two or three years ago. So we know that the, the difference between the local plan as we had it in 2015 and the emerging plan it is pretty stark and 90 metres was the maximum there. So if we'd had B2+, plus, a scheme arriving from that, um, it, it would have been a really welcome opportunity to update and upgrade that space, to increase the, the office blocks substantially to more than double what's available now. Um, and it would not have caused these problems in terms of height, um, and it wouldn't have caused these problems in terms of the, the national, uh, the NPPF, to 2023's requirement to support transition to a low carbon future. I was very surprised to hear or to read that this is being proposed as something that supports that transition. Um, this, from my perspective, this block is being over-optimized. 
the reality is if we, if we mean anything by doing the whole life carbon optioneering um, policy and, and actually committing to transitioning to a low carbon future, we have to mean that where there's a concern or a balance, do we have lower ceiling heights in the library space, in this new library space, or do we have 33,000 additional um, metric tons of, of, of CO2? The, the balance must fall in favour of us saying, well, well, no, actually, we can take a slightly shorter height for our library um, and have a building that is much closer to refurbishment um, and massively reduces the carbon footprint. Uh, there's a use of a term holistic sustainability in the report, which seems to include everything else other than environmental sustainability. Um, I am of the view, because of those factors, that this is an application that, that, that shouldn't be um, approved and isn't something that we should support. And it's a real shame because I would love to see the, that library supported um, into a new space um, that's upgraded. Um, but as I say, because of the environmental impact uh, and also because of the height exceeding uh, the emerging plans, but also the, the impact it has um, on the sight lines, um, I, I don't feel I can. Um, I just want to quote from the uh, letter from Historic England um, because I think it's important, and I hope somebody <coughs> might do it from the City of Westminster as well, um, that we're being told by the law officer here that... Um, we don't need to have looked at the consultee documents on the website. Um, that means we won't have read this bit because I've searched through the papers and it is not summarised, this sentence, in any of it. Um, it makes the point about inkinetic views. In kinetic views looking east along the Strand, the proposals would appear in the background of the two grade one listed churches to varying degrees. This would, they would fill the sky gap behind the churches, challenging their distinctive character and making it more difficult to read their skyline features. The proposals could therefore cause harm to the significance of the churches <coughs> and the surrounding conservation area, running counter to the general experience as a newly landscaped, pedestrianised, public open space where the churches form focal points. When seen cumulatively with 120 Fleet Street, the development form a continuous built backdrop in these views, thereby increasing the proposed harm. In summary, the proposal for Hill House would increase the built bulk of the skyline of the river frontage as seen in the LVMF views and adversely affect the experience of the Strand Conservation Area and its listed buildings, especially on the processional route. It's really important that we think about those other areas. We were a tiny local authority, a tiny area. Um, I'm sure many of us spend as much time in areas like the Strand Conservation Area as we do in the conservation areas within our own um, square mile. Um, and it's having, according to Historic England, um, a significant impact there in terms of the built bulk. It, well, it's challenging their distinctive character and making it more difficult to read their skyline features. Um, that sentence around challenging their distinctive character doesn't appear to have made its way into the summary. So I thought it was important that members had that in mind when making this decision. Um, and I, I would suggest that unless members have read the City of Westminster um, letter as a consultee and Historic England, that... Um, that certainly we're not in the best place position to be making a decision on this because there are impacts here that need to be considered. Any other comments? <coughs> Brendan, yeah. and then Marianne. Uh, thank you, Chair. So I um, agree with Natasha about the height and bulk of the building. I certainly have reservations about it. Uh, certainly is a significant heritage impact. On the other hand, on my site visit, um, I saw the wonderful work going on in Shule Library and also the discussions that have been taking place about what will be a brand new library, um, a world-class library, is absolutely going to be transformational for the community. So... We can't really see this uh, application in isolation without thinking about 120 uh, Fleet Street, which is obviously uh, already been granted. So on balance, um, everything considered, I will be supporting this application. Marianne? Thank you, Chairman. I think uh, Natasha summed it up perfectly. Um, <clears throat> this could have been an absolute fantastic design. It's nearly there. It's, it's just... 
the excessive heights and then the um, in, encroaching onto those historic views and the impact on those heritage assets um, identified by Westminster and by Historic England. I, th I personally believe that the architects and the developers could have found mitigation measures to reel it back. So you could have had the, the public benefits of the library, everything else that goes with this scheme, and not having that impact on our heritage. Uh, once those views are encroached, that's it. You know, you've got to wait another 100 years for these buildings to come down before you can get them back. Um, I think the... The huge amount of increase in office space is such that just losing a couple of stories to, to pull back so that you don't have that impact wouldn't have been detrimental to the development or to the developers and, um, and profit margins either. Um, I am concerned about the increase in trips because, again, there's a lot of assumptions in this whole document. There's assumptions on wind effect, there's assumptions on the deliveries, the daylight and sunlight loss of the residential properties. Uh, we just keep chip chipping away. We have policies, but we just, as I said, with that statement, you're never going to have um, one application according 100% with our policies. And with that, we just sweep everything away. I think we can do better. I think we should do better. Um, and for that reason, I won't be supporting it because, as I said, I think the developer could go that little bit further and have the scheme that fits every and ticks every box without having that detrimental impact. And I, and I do feel, going forward, we should be seeing all representation um, and, and not leaving it to summaries in our documents. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you. I, mean, I just would add that, I, in my view, a picture tells a thousand words. And when I look at those views from the Strand, personally, I think the impact is absolutely minimal. Um, um, you know, we, we saw it there before and after. Um, so, in my view, I think the, uh, the harm is minimal. I think the benefits are so uh, significant that I will be supporting it. Uh, John. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Um, I'd just like to reiterate what you said. I, I struggle to see what Westminster was talking about. Um, it's a background, a tiny fraction. Um, on the other hand, I, I was a little bit worried that we just spend years on this local plan and break it immediately. But I reconciled that by looking at the other buildings as well. And, and, and you, this particular building, it's only, it's actually quite narrow at the top. It's not the whole building. It's not like it's a flat top. It's getting narrow. Mm -hmm. And then you look at the other buildings in the area, um, assuming 120 is going to get built, mm -hmm. and, and, and the one behind that, the Goldman Sachs building, they, they all come together. And it, it it looks quite good. It, it doesn't look out of place if you look at the whole lot. It, it, it almost looks like a, like, a, like a lotus flower, you know, the, the coming together. So I, I think it's, it's, it's fine. It's just, it's just a shame that, that, as we all agree, you know, we just said 90 and now we're 94.8. And I, I don't think, I don't disagree with the officers, but that's not insignificant. That's, that's 4.8 metres. But it, it does actually work with what's going on and we do realise that the way we get these buildings to look okay is to make these clusters and this is our second cluster and it does look quite good so I'm, I'm fine with it and, and as for the library um, the, the, the existing library was not particularly pleasant I mean I used to go there just to get plastic bags you know rubbish bags because that there was a distribution city for bags there but it wasn't a particularly pleasant library really this, this new one is going to be fantastic. Mm. So I, I, I think this is great. Thank you, Chairman. Absolutely. Any other comments? Uh, Alistair. Thank you very much. Um, I'd just be interested to hear the uh, legal advice as to what our statutory duty here is, technically. I think I know the answer, but on the point as to whether we're meant to cast a, a view as to whether an applicant could do better or whether we weigh up an application on its planning merits. I think it's the latter, but if you just confirm that. Um, my, my view is that um, this is an exemplary scheme, and the, the main reason for that is that um, the, the other side of the coin to this whole carbon argument is that the proper utilisation of space is the key thing here. We've got embodied carbon. We heard that 90% of the subterranean structure is going to be um, reused or retained. 
And like John, I mean, I can remember using this library for the last 20 years or so, but describing where it is, and the majority of people don't know where it is, it's just, we're being a bit selfish, I think, obstructing something where that can be revitalized and properly used. That is using an inordinate amount of carbon operationally and embedded for a space which probably a tiny proportion of people, despite our library's excellent library's team effort, doesn't actually know that exists. So I think that alone, as has been alluded to by colleagues, is something which we should have, which we should be showing to the mix here. I also totally agree with the comments that have been made by some colleagues in relation to the St Mary Le Strand, it is an extraordinary argument that somehow stuff that's kind of going on at the sides distracts from what's kind of going up above and seeing what the form is of a grade one structure. I mean, it's, it's kind of, it's a little insulting to think that one's vision is disturbed by things that are going on at the side, which as I said, is already disrupted anyway. So I think we should disregard those comments. And also, it's uh, fair to say that, as before, we've debated before, Historic England particularly are not in a position to advise in relation to public benefits. Things like libraries, all the things this, this application is bringing to us, they are the government's advisors in relation to heritage. That's what they do really, really well. But they're not in a position to advise on all the other benefits here, which, to my mind, really tip the planning balance here for approval. Chairman. Thank you. Um, could we just take a 15 minute break? And uh, so back at 12.15, um, just slightly after 12.15.
reconvene. Uh -huh. yes. <clears throat> um, I'm hoping we can move swiftly to a vote, but uh, before I do that, does anybody else want to say anything? Good, let's uh, over to you, Tom Clark. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Yes, so we'll move uh, to the, the formal vote uh, now, just uh, for clarity. Uh, members, we're voting on uh, item four uh, and the, the recommendations, which are mainly uh, on page 41 of the main agenda pack, but also uh, with the relevant amendments set out in the addenda, which includes uh, an additional condition in the first addendum and uh, an amendment to the obligations in the second uh, addendum. So, uh, members, happy to proceed on that basis. Uh, so, could I ask all those, please, voting in favour of the application, uh, please raise your hand and, and leave it raised. So that's nine in favour. Thank you. Uh, would those voting against the application, please raise your hand and, and leave it raised. Thank you. Five, six. That's, that's six. Uh, and uh, for the avoidance of doubt, are, are any members abstaining, please? Uh, so uh, that's uh, nine votes in favour and six votes against, uh, Chairman, which means um, that's carried. Thank you very much. Uh, so let's move on to the next item. Chairman. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Item Mr. <coughs> Sorry, Mr. Fletcher. Sorry. John. Yeah. I think this is the Port Southland Pavilion, isn't it? Ah, yeah. yes. So yes. A declaration. Um, sorry, I was a bit dozy at the beginning of the meeting. Uh, apologies, Chairman. I need to declare an interest because I'm the Governor of the Old Gate School. So I won't be speaking or voting on this motion. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you. Uh, uh, thank you all. Um, so, yes, item number five is uh, the reasons for refusal uh, for Port Socombe Pavilion at 1 Aldgate Square. Uh, it's a report to the Chief Planning Officer and Development Director and the Comptroller and City Solicitor for decision at page 333. Uh, and uh, just to advise... Uh, members that only members who took part in the original debate and vote on this item uh, may consider the item today. I have a list of the members who took part in the debate as follows. Deputy Shravan Joshi, Deputy Vandal Anderson, Brendan Barnes, Ian Bishop Laggart, Mary Durkin, John Edwards, Dawn Frampton, Deputy Marianne Fredericks, Deputy Edward Lord, Anthony Manchester, Deputy Alistair Moss, uh, Ian Seeson, Hugh Selker and Shailendra Mradia. Um, Chief Planning Officer. Thank you. I think um, we can just take this as read. Uh, can we agree this? Sorry. Uh, so, Marianne. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Thank you, Chairman. Um, if you'd actually, if we looked in the, the minutes that we approved, I think there was, um, uh, in addition to these grounds, it was quite clear that um, the pub use was a departure from the original planning application and the social enterprise um, of, the, of the cafe. And, and so I wondered whether or not we could actually um, incorporate that. And I did notice that um, uh, one of the conditions uh, that was suggested for item four was to ensure that the approved drawings and the uses didn't, didn't change, didn't morph. I think that was the point that um, was made earlier about uh, removing public benefits and the concerns that we grant things and then they can morph. Um, and it made it clear that that condition was to ensure the development didn't give rise to uh, environmental impacts that were in excess or different to those assessed in the application and the public benefits. Uh, and therefore, I think it's important that we, we do reference the fact that the pub use was completely alien to the original planning application and, um, and therefore had a detrimental effect on the environment of the whole square. Um, and if you, if you looked at the minutes, it was made clear that, you know, I think Mr Lord made the point that had we been told it was going to be a pub at the outset, we wouldn't have granted it as a pub. Um, and therefore, I, I personally would like to see that uh, firmed up. It's not just the pub use. It's the fact that it's, a, a, it's totally alien to the original application. Uh, it has, it's a departure. It has a detrimental impact to the uh, environment of the square um, uh, be, because of its change. Thank you. Um, somebody from planning to respond to that? Um, yes, I think it is acknowledged that it is a different use and that's why the planning application requires the 
the change of use that has been refused by members at the previous committee. Um, the ground of refusal that has been drafted for approval today uh, reflects that it is a change of use and that change of use is unacceptable for the reasons set out. The original planning permission, uh, if I recollect properly, is didn't, uh, was for a restaurant. Uh, it didn't have a condition or a legal agreement specifying social enterprise use within that. And so we need to draft a legally sound ground of refusal that this is an unacceptable change of use from one use, a restaurant, to another, a pub, for the grounds that set out. The impact on the public open space and the broad definition of uh, the uh, detrimental impact, apologies, on amenity, do encompass everything that has just been referenced and officers are confident that that would be arguable in an appeal should it, should it come forward. Um, it should be referenced the fact that it, it was supposed to be a social enterprise, uh, the cafe use was supposed to be a social enterprise, i.e. giving something back to the community. Uh, sorry, Chair, if I may, uh, as I said, the original planning application, that may well have been the, the wider corporate intention, but the planning permission did not uh, restrict through condition or obligation as a social enterprise. It was a restaurant. If we were to insert that within the ground for refusal and an appeal was to be made by the applicant, uh, we consider as officers that would amount to a liability for a p potential award of costs. Thank you. Uh, Alistair. Mm -hmm. um, can I just ask, I, I was kind of shot down uh, by the Chief Planning Officer quite rightly in the end of the, on the minutes kind of trying to throw in other things like improving open spaces, biodiversity and activity and things like that because I agree we should really try and keep this as tight as possible, particularly on the cost point you said. One thing that was mentioned, speaking up on what Marianne was saying, was the proximity to the school as well. And that, uh, is it officers' view that extending beyond the detrimental impact on the immediate character of the public open space to the function of the school or something like that, because we did hear from the school from memory about that, would be a step too far? Chairman. Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, the opening line does reference the school. Uh, by reason of its location within the public open I, space yeah. uh, adjacent to the east entrance of the Allgate School and the west side of St Boltoff's Church, Aldgate. Yeah. So we are saying that the, the overall impacts within that location, those proximities, is unacceptable because, for that very reason. I do apologise. I'll read properly next time. <laughs> <laughs> so can we agree the wording as it stands? Thank you. Tim Clark. Uh, thank you, uh, Chair. With that uh, having been agreed, that takes us then to uh, item six, uh, which uh, was provided in the information pack. Uh, that's a uh, valid uh, planning applications received by the Department of the Built Environment. Uh, that was uh, asterisked, and there were no uh, comments or questions in advance. Um, but was that on item seven, Alderman? Actually, six out of seven. Okay. Um, <coughs> so we can do them on under seven or now? Okay. Sure. Yeah. Um, Sorry, this, this is about the application that uh, you have just received for um, Cromwell Tower, the Barbican. Um, it's the installation of 92 small antennae. Um, I just wanted to be very sure because um, I've obviously, well, I think all Cripplegate members have already had a number of objections. It appears that nobody has been properly consulted. Um, and I just, I, I'm, I'm not saying, sorry, I'm not saying nobody has. I'm sure that some people have been consulted, but the residents of Conwell Tower seem to be unaware of it. And I know there has been more correspondence this morning, but I just wondered if the officers could just um, confirm that people will be consulted and that objections will be noted uh, and that it will come to a planning application if necessary, a, a, a meeting if necessary. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Chair. Uh, duly noted, um, con all residents of the tower will be uh, notified by post as per ISCI and they are due to be received uh, this week. <laughs> and of course, all representations in support or objection would be taken into account to determine the application. 
Yeah, so, yeah. No, no, sorry. Yes, it just seems that, um, I mean, that was, it was actually, um, I, I think the, the, the first date, the date is, it's, so it, it was actually 7th of, of March that you validated it. So it has been sitting around for some time. So I just would be grateful. Um, I think it's admin things, obviously, but it's really important for the people not to have this bombshell. Thank you. Uh, yes, just to clarify, the, the validation date is the day after the receipt of the application. So if there has been a period of time uh, for some admin delay, for instance, I can't speculate on this particular application, but it, it would be backdated to the day after receipt of the application. So that would explain the, the uh, discrepancies on the date. Uh, thank you. Um, uh, item number seven, then, are delegated decisions of uh, the Chief Planning Officer and Development Director. Again, that is uh, for information, but I received notice uh, of a question on that from uh, Older Woman Pearson thank and uh, one from Deborah Oliver as well. Um, right, thank you. I just wanted to, uh, first of all, uh, thank the Planning Officer who eventually approved Golden Lane Resident Cycle Parking Project after I raised it at the last planning meeting. Um, I'd also like to draw your attention to and question why 81 Newgate Street is only now being reported as approved. Did the Chief Planning Officer forget to include it up until now? I think there was a delay. I think it was an unintentional delay and we'll set out the reasons for that delay um, to members at the next committee. But um, there was certainly... Um, it, it ought to have been brought and in, included in the delegated list area. We think it was down to an admin error where the wrong box was ticked on our uniform computer system, but we'll, um, we'll have the full explanation by next committee. Um, and just before we uh, move to Deborah uh, Oliver's question, could uh, members um, okay to agree a short extension? So I notice we're at 12.30. Uh, agree. Th agree. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Ms. Oliver. Uh, th thank you. It was uh, another question about uh, Newgate Street, really building on the points that uh, Alderwoman uh, Pearson's made. Uh, I wasn't clear about the additional three stories mentioned in the paper, um, but it, it also references approval about the terrace being only privately available and not being accessible for the public. So I really wanted to query whether the additional height requirement has been agreed in the past by the subcommittee and really a supplementary to it, um, is the subcommittee able to discuss that the uh, terrace is not accessible for the public because I do think that is detrimental. Thank you. On the point of the additional story, this scheme in terms of bulk height and massing was identical to the scheme which was submitted uh, to this committee on the 23rd of June 2020. Um, the impact of the bulk item massing was discussed at that committee and that was approved unanimously. So that has been subject to committee scrutiny. Um, in terms of the um, public terrace, I did make a full response to this at the previous committee. Um, the, um, it, it was within a amendments to a scheme the public access to the terrace was not required for a policy reason. It was a nice to have, unfortunately that fell away. Um, neither was it required to mitigate heritage harm. Um, so the, the, the relevant paragraph of uh, the NPPF was not action. So um, if you look back at the minutes, the full response to that question is set out. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Uh, we'll move on then to uh, item number eight. Oh, sorry, Marianne. What was this? Can I ask a question? Mm -hmm. a question? Thank you. Um, just a couple of things. Um, in relation to the application that we, we heard today, um, I'm not sure if all members received an email on Friday afternoon um, from um, the company that's working with uh, Landsec inviting uh, us and the public to um, join them in public consultation to help design the new street square um, public realm 
which I thought was a bit cheeky coming, sending us an email on, on Friday, just gone, when the application wasn't before us until today. And, and that brings me on to the, the other point that um, was reported in, in City Matter um, about the corporation in regard with London or West um, telling sorry, the sorry, consultees no. that Marianne, um, the we're going application off was going we're to going, be recommended. Sorry, we're going off piste here. Okay, this, this is not the Grand Committee. We're here to discuss uh, two... two uh, we're here to discuss Hill House. We've done that. Um, if you want to raise that sort of thing, take it to the Grand Committee. I thought it was to do with planning applications, which is why I raised it yeah. here, because I thought Chairman, that's what planning Chairman, on a point of order, on a point of order, if London Moor West is going to be raised, yeah. there are several members in this room, including myself, who might need to leave immediately. Mm. So, no, I, I don't want to talk about London Moor okay. West. I just wondered if officers could, could answer the comment that was in the City Matters so that it, it's dealt with on public records. No, no, I don't... I mean, I, 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 you know, it's just Am I allowed to raise the question about the city plan consultation? Because that's, on the, that's before our next planning meeting. OK, we've got, we've, got, we've got an agenda item on questions about the work of the subcommittee. At the moment, we've, we've, we, we haven't got to that in the agenda yet. I was sorry, I thought we were on the question. No, no. no. Chair, Chairman, Pardon? the yeah. matters on behalf of the subcommittees in relation to planning applications, not the city plan. The city plan should yes. be covered within the grant committee. Thank you, yeah. Right, let's move on. Uh, 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 item number eight, uh, as happens, it is uh, questions on matters related to the work of the subcommittee, and I believe Alderman Pearson uh, had a question to ask uh, at this yeah. juncture. Thank you, Chair. Um, the blog site Reclaim EC1 has described how the Chief Planning Officer approved an application for the redevelopment of 65 Gresham Street by himself under delegated authority although that authority does not cover a scheme that fails to accord with planning policy, like this scheme by admission of the applicant's own <coughs> agent, or a scheme that is of broad interest, like this scheme, which was of such broad interest that the City Corporation issued a press release announcing its approval. Can the Chief Planning Officer please explain why he determined this application himself instead of bringing it to committee? And it's not an answer for the Chief Planning Officer to say that he consulted the Chair and Deputy Chair about the scheme and they agreed that he could determine it by himself under the delegation. There is nothing in the corporate documentation on delegations that permits planning applications to be determined under delegation because the Chair and Deputy Chair think that it should be. Thank you. I, Chairman, if I may. Yeah. Um, I'll leave the Chief Planning Office to answer in detail, but if this blog is being mentioned, I don't think it should be go without passing that there was a large amount of abuse and personal insult in the piece being referenced. That is not the way we should do things in the city, and I wanted to take this opportunity to condemn that personal abuse, and I'm sure the whole committee, subcommittee will join me in condemning any personal attacks, whether be they against an officer or a member. Thanks, Chair. Yes. And over to Quinn. Can I just, on a point of order, also say that the information contained in that website is abusive towards officers as well. And as Chairman of Corporate Services, I think it's perfectly within the remit of any officer not to engage in any discussion regarding that with that website. But obviously, it's within the remit of the Chief Planning Officer to respond as he wishes or not. Chief Planning Officer. Firstly, thank you, uh, Sue Pearson, for the forewarning of the question, and I don't disagree with um, what's been said about the, the, the blog. Um, so, as members are aware, this is in relation to um, the, the, the adjoining site. Paragraph 167 of the scheme of delegation was adopted by the Court of Common Council. It sets out parameters where planning applications can be dealt with under delegated authority. There are three criteria. The first is that the application is in accordance with policy. You mentioned a third party. I cannot comment on, a, on any suggestions from third parties, but the delegated officer report on the planning application is readily available on the planning portal. It's a 25-page, very comprehensive report, and it does not identify policy non-compliance issues with the scheme. Therefore, it is a policy-compliant scheme in line with the criteria, the first criteria of the scheme of delegation. The second criteria is the number of objections received, which should be no more than nine. We received a single objection um, on, on behalf uh, uh, as part of this scheme, so therefore that's in line with the scheme of delegation. 
The third criteria is that the application is not of broad interest. Clearly, the definition of broad interest is more of a matter of judgment, which we exercise. In this particular application, the scheme was a light touch re retrofitting, a retrofitting of an existing 11-storey building and adding three storeys. Our schemes go, our schemes go, this is pretty typical of the genre of applications which make up most of the city schemes. There were no wider interests. There were no breaches in things like St. Paul's Heights um, or Protective Vistas and, this, and so on. So um, I, I'm, I'm taking on your point. This was done, I will take full ownership of that decision. This was done within the scheme of delegation <coughs> that I exercised um, and at no point did um, I ask for authorization from either the chairman or the deputy chairman. In terms of the press release on the planning permission and the suggestion that this is evidence of broader interest, it would, it's worth considering that this, this, this scheme was worth highlighting within the context of the emerging retrofit first local plan policy, the utilisation of the carbon options advice note in the application process, and really to send an external message that despite contrary viewpoints, the city is proud of its retrofitting schemes um, in the pipeline which often do not receive the media coverage they deserve. That was the rationale for that um, communications piece, not as evidence of broader interest. But again, I would reiterate on your final point, I take full ownership of the decision to deal with this scheme under delegated authority. Thank you. Um, I'd just like to say a few words. I mean, good, good planning authorities uh, practice extensive delegated authority to keep things moving. Over 90% of our uh, applications are dealt with on delegated authority. If that changed significantly, the planning system would grind to a halt. Um, in my view, if there are a small number or no objections to applications and officers have carefully scrutinised them and shaped them to be acceptable and policy compliant, surely this is a positive. We have more than enough applications coming to uh, our committee already and our planning team is highly competent and they don't need to be micromanaged by members. And uh, that's my view and I hope that most of the committee support me. Great. Yep. Yeah. Thank you. Any other questions? Uh, Ian, and then Marianne. Sorry, ju just a, a small follow-on from uh, from this question. The, mm. the uh, planning application includes the stopping up of the road, as far as I remember in the presentation. Mm. But was that separately considered, or was that also delegated permission? Uh, yes, Alderman Bree will be subject to a Section 278 agreement, which is secured uh, in the usual way through the planning permission, uh, and that will see uh, through the, as you'll see on the on the portal, illustrative proposals for a range of public realm enhancements to Alderman Bree, which officers consider to be of great benefit and uh, will great enhance <coughs> the, uh, the environment in the city and around the Guildhall. However, um, it, there is no stopping up proposed. It's likely to be. Uh, a managed closure, timed closures, that will be uh, fleshed out in greater detail through the 278 process. Presumably there will have to be some sort of statutory process for that in, in terms of traffic orders or? Uh, yes, our yep. highways and transport colleagues will undertake yep. any statutory duties yep. in regards to publicity or any other orders that require to bring forward any uh, 278 works. Yep. Uh, Marianne. Sorry, thank you. So if I just go back to the My London article that was published on Friday, um, it suggests that um, regarding London Mall West, um, the corporation issued a uh, letter... Chairman, can I just say a point of order again? Yeah. I've said it once, I'll say it again. Can if I London Mall is going to be mentioned correct, again in this meeting, it will force me out of this meeting, and I think others too who are precluded according to legal advice. So I'd ask you to ask the member not to mention London Wall West again. Yeah. I'm asking if that story is correct because it's suggesting that everyone's been told there's a green light. Um, so I don't know if it's true. And I think I think for the public it should be it should be transparent and clear a response for the public so they know whether or not that story is correct I've, or not. I don't know, I don't know what the story is. I'm sure the officers don't. And Chair, um, point of order, yeah. you already ruled on this. Yeah. Can we move on, please? Yeah. Yes. yes. It's just, I'm not an expert, so I'm not, just not quite sure what's going on at the moment. No, neither is, am is I. somebody I'm leaving? I don't want to talk about London Wall West. It's as simple as that. Stop. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So can we move on? 
Natasha, have you got a different question? I have. I have two different Thank you. questions. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so I just wanted to um, ask about the point I raised before around um, what's contained within the papers. Um, I think it would really help, I hope it would really help all members, if we had clarity as to the approach taken. Because it, it, I, my recollection, I, I agree with Marianne, that there has been a change. I, I, I remember seeing Historic England documents in here before, and I think it would really help us, not just at the next planning application subcommittee to have consultees included, but to have perhaps the next planning transportation, a very brief understanding, could be by way of email in advance, of what is proposed to be included, because um, we make, there's, there's, there's perhaps, it's perhaps a moment to look at what's going to be most helpful to members. I'm very grateful to officers who've started to include as a table at the front information. That's really valuable. And it seems to me that things that are referred to repeatedly, like the environmental statement, the consultee comments where they object or where they raise concerns, as opposed to Tower, Tower Hamlet saying, we have no comment, those clearly aren't going to help us. But it would help us to have ones which are going to be summarised herein and where there's substantive comments made. So it might be worth just having um, an, an email let, letting us know as members what's proposed to be included or it to be included as a brief agenda item in planning transportation next time, because it will really help us. I think we as members know when we look at these, we sometimes go through and go, oh, I, I wonder where that document is. And there are probably a three or four different types of document that we all as members think, oh, well, that would help me, and that wouldn't. So having that conversation as a membership might be quite helpful. Um, so that was my first question and request, whether or not that's something that we could... Well, let's, let's deal with that now. Um, we, I mean, we can't decide that, but we could uh, pass that on to the Grand Committee. Well, no, I mean, we can commit to include every representation. I think it has to be everything, mm. even the no comments, to be absolutely clear, so we can commit to adding those in the background papers in any planning application coming for you. Chairman. Yes, John. Uh, Chairman, some of the papers we get are bigger than War and Peace already. I'm quite content with the way things are managed at the moment, and I think most members are. It, I'm, I'm damaging my, my, my mat, my front door mat, the weight of the papers that come through mm. So let's just keep it as it is, please, because we're all perfectly competent to follow uh, appendices and, and links. Yeah. I mean, if we can't agree this today, I think this is a topic for the Grand Committee, to be honest. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and then the second question was just in relation to the procedural point. I won't go into the specific applications mentioned, but the procedural point around um, what we can raise in AOB um, at the Planning application Subcommittee. Yeah. One of the reasons that I understood we'd reduced the number of Planning and Transportation Committee meetings and had the Planning Subcommittee, there was, of course, the kind of legal division um, between the two, <coughs> but also that if there is anything that arises that's urgent, we have such frequency of Planning application Subcommittees that effectively they can be raised as AOB in this, and it doesn't mean we have to have endless grant committees. Um, but if what we're being told is that anything that doesn't relate directly to the application that has arisen or those listed in the next agenda item can't be raised as part of the AOB, then I think that might need to be revisited. So I would like an understanding as to what can be raised and can't be, because otherwise these are quarterly, these, these planning transportation main grand committees, and it may mean that actually we need to revisit that. And that would be a real shame because actually this functions quite well. And the AOB means that if something's in the media that's concerning residents and we as representatives are receiving emails or concerns about that, it can be very clearly put to bed in this environment by way of comments made as an answer in the AOB section. And I would think that would be a real shame to lose that facility. Um, and so I just want to understand that whatever, and I, a bit like Deborah, wasn't, quite clear as to the justification for what took place, but um, that we understand that matters that would normally be dealt with in the Grand Committee can be raised as AOB. And if it's something like this where we say, can't be agreed today, but goes off to the Grand Committee, that that's acceptable. I just want to understand that a little bit more clearly. Well, the, <clears throat> the relevant heading of the agenda items, questions on matters relating to the work of this subcommittee. This subcommittee mm -hmm. is solely involved in planning application subcommittee. Clearly, that's a matter, matter for members, but that's what's set out. That's my understanding too. Um, so can I clarify that given every single application we receive makes reference to the local plan and the emerging plan and talks about how much weight that should be given, that questions that relate to the plan, 
the emerging plan, particularly if, there's a, or if there are consultations coming down the track on things, can be raised by way of AOB? I think this is a matter for Planning and Transportation Committee and the governance of this. I mean, I understand the point. I understand that everything has a relevance in a planning application. Um, but the agenda item is specifically in relation to dealing with planning applications. So I, I would suggest that this is a matter the Planning and Transportation Committee, Grand Committee, needs to consider and decide on. So something else for the Grand Committee to discuss at its next meeting? Yes. Any other questions? Saying none? Uh, well, the, the last item, uh, Chairman, is, is any other business uh, that you consider to be urgent? I have none. Um, that's, uh, Thank you very much.